So, Father, I thank you for Aaron. I thank you that you have raised him up for such a time as this, with an anointing to teach the Hebraic words of our faith, to bring the scriptures to life, Lord, according to what is, what is written with that Hebraic mindset. Lord, just bless him tonight, bring your anointing upon him, and Lord, use him tonight. May we hear you through Aaron tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you very much, Sharon. I hope I can live up to that glowing praise. <laughs> it's the Lord. <laughs> First of all, Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom. Yes, now even though this is the Sabbath, and technically we're not supposed to work on the Sabbath, I want everybody to know this is not work for me. <laughs> and I'm having fun. Okay? Good. And I hope that you'll be able to wrestle discuss and learn and have fun as well because study according to the Jewish tradition is the highest form of worship mm. nothing against singing and praise okay they love to do that too but the idea of sitting around and reading God's word and, and, and meeting him on those pages is a, is a form of worship so tonight we're going to do the overview all the background stuff to the Lord's Prayer, to the manuscripts that we've got in front of us, to uh, reading some Jewish prayers of the Second Temple period, so that tomorrow, when we meet together, uh, for those that will come, uh, we, will, we will actually be well grounded and prepared to just launch into the, the six lines that are actually part of this, this prayer. If you're not going to be able to make it tomorrow, it will be on the CMJ website. So, heavily edited with all the heresies taken out. <laughs> so, it'll be about five minutes long. <laughs> so, first of all, prayer. This is not a Catholic prayer, is it? No. no. Not owned by the Greek Orthodox, and it's not something that uh, was invented by the church. It is absolutely obvious that this is taught by the master himself to his disciples, of which we are then. And yet, I guess maybe <laughs> because we've been praying the same thing for 2,000 years, some of us kind of lost the idea or the enthusiasm to actually do it. Which is a bit of a shame, isn't it? Okay. And so, what is Prayer. Our master taught us pray. Is there a command in the Bible to pray? Where? There is one. Yes, there is one. There is only one instance where we are told as a command to pray. Pray. Without ceasing. Yes. Yeah. In the imperative. But in the Hebrew Bible, that is at the time of Yeshua, there was no command to pray. So did people pray? Oh, yes. But there wasn't a command, you have to do this. What is prayer? I hear you ask. Very good question. See? <laughs> The word to pray in Hebrew is lehit halal. Lehit halal. And I know you knew that. <laughs> it's a reflexive verb. What is a reflexive verb? I hear you ask. You guys are full of questions. <laughs> and they're good ones. What is a reflexive verb? Now, we know that there are verbs that are active, passive, um, reflexive. There's there's, there's, in, in Greek, there's even more verb forms. Um, an active verb would be something like, um, I open the door. I'm the subject, I'm the subject, object is the door, and I am in the action of opening it. That is an active verb. If I say the sentence, the door is closed, that is a passive verb. Because the door cannot open or close itself. So something has come along and closed the door. A reflexive verb is something you do yourself. 
So, of which prayer is. So the verb form, lehit, anything, is a passive verb. Sorry, a reflexive verb. So if I want to say, um, I'd like to get married, I say lehit chatem, which is actually reflexive. Which is an interesting thought in and of itself, and a completely old new study. Because <laughs> I'm sure there's two people involved here. But when I pray, in a, in, a very, in a very interesting way, this is something I do to myself. How does that work? Well, we ask the question, does God need your prayers? Right? And the answer has to be, no. <laughs> right? He doesn't need them. So whether I talk to him or not, he will still be king. He was king before I came along, and he will be king long after I am gone. And whether I pray to him or not, he will do his perfect will. He does not act just because I say so. Heaven forbid any of us think that. Okay. So that's probably the reason why in the Hebrew Bible there is no command to pray. Because it's actually something we need to do. God doesn't need our prayers, but He does want them. He desires them. And He wants to talk back. So He wants me to talk to Him, and He would like to talk back to me. And the way to do that is in reflexive prayers. Prayer is something we do to ourselves, even though we're actually talking to the Lord, and He is talking back. Jesus said, he said a very Jewish thing. It's not what goes in your mouth that's important, it's what comes out. Because what actually comes out of your mouth reflects something, your heart. What's actually going on inside. And therefore we actually need to listen to our breath. Because if you keep praying for a big house and a big sports car, and that's the only thing coming out of your lips, Think about where your heart is. And that is actually a very dangerous prayer because Jesus said that it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. And so if Jesus said it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven, and we all want to be in the kingdom of heaven, why are we praying for riches? Ooh. That's a very silly thing to be praying for. We need to hear the prayers that are coming out of our lips. Many times when I'm in Israel, people will tell me how strong they are, how much they trust the Lord. And they know that God is totally in control. And you sit down in a prayer session and they're always like, help me Lord, I don't know what I'm doing, help me Lord, I'm really in trouble. <laughs> like, okay, now I know where you really are. And I wish you could hear your own prayers. So we should be in the status of listening to the words that come out of our mouth and then we can recognize where our heart is. So who really needs to pray? Okay, I do. And so God, in His wisdom, in His, in his love, in His authority and compassion, He gives us a simple prayer book. It's called the Book of Psalms. That's 150 of these prayers. And these are prayers that Jewish people pray every, every month. So by the time you get through one calendar month, you've prayed every prayer, sometimes many times, uh, in, in, even in a day. And um, in those Psalms, there is a prayer for every single one of our emotions. Some of the prayers are very happy Psalms. Some of the Psalms are sad Psalms. Some of them are good Psalms, some of them are bad Psalms. Okay? It's the Dr. Seuss of the Psalms. <laughs> but, some of the Psalms are joyful. Hallelujah, praise the Lord, all the nations. But some Psalms are just sad. And there's not even one line of happiness, or praise, or hope. And you go, oh my gosh, why would that be in the prayer book? Because God made us. And when he made me, I don't know about you guys, but when he made me, I've got emotions. And I'm made in his image. He has emotions. God gets angry. God gets happy. God falls in love. 
God gets sad. God gets jealous. God is in way better control of his emotions than I am. But he knows that I am emotional. And so he's actually given me prayers to reflect what's really going on in my heart. So when I'm sad, God doesn't say, tell me how happy you are, Aaron. Because he knows I'm already sad. So he says, this is a prayer for you. Talk to me. Tell me your heart. You tell yourself your heart. Because after this, after I've come and made all things well, I've got a happy sound. I've got a hopeful sound. I've got a sound to remind you what sort of a king I am. So prayer is a, is a beautiful thing. It is not a command, although we finally get one, to pray that without ceasing. Hopefully we're going to answer that question, what that means, uh, a little later. But it is something we do to ourselves. It's something we really should want to do, because God's going to be involved. Plus, Jesus gives us some guidelines as to how to do it. Now, has anyone heard of the word, or the Yiddish word, to doven? To doven. Yes, you have. Daven sometimes, but doven in, uh, in the Yiddish, in Israel. That's a Yiddish word for, for to go pray. Right? And it means, in Yiddish, to move your lips. Right? Prayer actually isn't something you're supposed to do silently. Because you're supposed to hear the words coming out of your mouth. Even if it's just quiet. Now, remember there was a lady called Hannah. She was actually standing in front of the parochia, the, uh, the curtain in the tabernacle. And she was praying. She was moving the lips. And, uh, and what did Eli do? He thought she was drunk. drunk. He couldn't actually hear what she was saying, but he could see that something was, was going on. So this is a, the Yiddish idea is that when you get together and pray, you should actually now out something. Which means that prayer is not uh, silent, it is an action. In fact, many things in the Jewish world are actions. Love is an action. Faith is an action. Hope is an action. They're all actions. And prayer is, is one of those. Prayer, Levit uh, Palel, comes from a Shoresh. Everything in Israel is from a Shoresh, a root of three letters. And the word Palel, to, uh, it, within the word to pray, means to, to judge. And you can see that in uh, Exodus 21 where in Exodus 21, verse 22, we get a small little, one of these little uh, interesting commands out of the 300, uh, 613 commands, which says, if men, two men, who are fighting, hit a pregnant woman and she gives birth prematurely, but there is no serious injury, that is, the baby actually survives, okay, the offender must be fined whatever the woman's husband demands, and the palelim, that is, the judges, decide. So there's this, there's this use of the verb to pray, but in the sense of judgment. Okay. You, it also means to fall down. So in Isaiah 45, verse 12, no, 14, Isaiah 45, verse 14, we read of these people who come. This is what the Lord says, the products of Egypt and the merchandise, merchandise of Cush and those tall Sabaeans, they will come over to you and they will be yours. They will trudge behind you, they will come over to you in chains. Then it says they will bow down. But in Hebrew it says they will yit palelu you. Doesn't mean they will pray. Doesn't mean they will judge. It means they will fall down in, uh, in front of them. So, prayer has this idea of self-judgment. Be self-reflective. How is my heart actually going before the Lord? A bit of self-evaluation in there. And as part of this little process of introspection, the idea of actually standing before the Lord. 
And so in Jewish tradition, Jewish, Jewish men in particular, although there are some who do this, they get their little prayer shawls. Who's seen their prayer shawls? They're absolutely fantastic. They make you look like Superman. Okay? Because you have to put on this cape, and you have a wrong cape. And, uh, and you feel really good when you do it. And, uh, but you actually put um, it over your head, and you create a personal space in amongst community. So there's an aspect of community in prayer, and at the same time, an aspect of trying to find a personal private, private space. And in that process, you see them often doing this, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Which is, um, there's many reasons why they do that. One is because Hebrew is actually rhythmic and actually poetic, so they could be just keeping time. However, the most, the most uh, uh, honest answer is they're falling down. That they're constantly in the motion of palele, okay? Is part of their prayer life. Notice also that the elders in, in Revelation and the angels, what are they always doing before the Lord? Falling down. And we're always in the process of, of making sure that He is the exalted one and we are not. And this is part of something that you actually do yourself, not forced, right? It's something that's a reflexive uh, form of the verb. And this idea of of uh, coming down and, and in part of our prayer life, um, engaging in, in a little bit of self, self uh, evaluation and judgment. So when you fall down and you prostrate yourself, the, the, the notion is that God Himself is in front of you. They literally believe that when you pray, the Lord God Himself is in front of you. You're always bowing before your King, and when you've finished prayers, what do you do in front of a king when you're finished? You walk backwards. Has anyone seen the, uh, the really cool movie, The Darkest Hour? Anyone see that? Yeah, yep, great, great show. Right, so when Winston Churchill had finished his discussion with the king, how did he exit the room? He walked backwards, right? You do that to a human king, you most definitely do that to a divine one. And so they will, once they've finished prayers, they will take a minimum of three steps back. That tells the Lord, okay, I'm finished now. If you see my shoulder, it's not an insult. Okay. Uh, some people do a little bit more. And um, if you're actually in Israel, you'll notice that the ones who walk back the most are the girls. They do. Yes. They do indeed. I can never quite figure that out because the boys, come on, well, look yeah. over here. They, they get quite, um, quite devout and they will walk back quite a long, a long way. Because if you believe that God has actually come down, you are engaging in one aspect of the Jewish tradition that, for me, is very powerful. Heaven meets earth. Mm -hmm. right? Heaven always wants to intersect on the planet. God, when he made the world, where was he? In the garden. In the beginning, God made over to the earth. So where was he before? <laughs> he was not in heaven. No. Beyond. Right? He did not make heaven and go, Phew, so glad I made that. <laughs> I mean, I've just been wandering around here all by myself and uh, it's been kind of lonely. No, we don't know. We have no idea. But what we do know is that when God made heaven, he didn't think, wow, this is a really good home for me. And it is not a home for you. The meek inherit the earth. Yes. Where is our final home? Here. For God so loved the earth. That does not mean all the people in it. It means the world. That happens to have a lot of people in it. And he loves them too. But God loves earth. And why not? He made it. And earth itself is desiring God's attention. Paul says creation is groaning for its redemption, not its destruction. Right? And we will discuss that as we go through the prayer. 
right? When we want God's will to be done on earth and in heaven. Okay? Is that God made heaven, yes. And he made earth, yes. And when he did, he constantly made things together that were meant to work together. Male, female. Jews, Gentiles. Good, evil, light, darkness. Heaven, earth. <coughs> and heaven always did its best to come to earth. And there are spots on this planet that are even extra special. For example, the Temple Mountain. Yeah. Right? It's very special where, where heaven intersects uh, <coughs> earth and God will constantly be coming down to, to, to talk to people. He constantly wanted to have fellowship. He's constantly looking for, uh, for people to, to talk to and communicate to and share their life with. When God took his people out of Egypt, and you've got your Jewish caps on here, when God took his people out of Egypt, there the Exodus. Israel came out of Egypt. Who else came out with them? Uh, mixed multitudes and Gentiles as well. And then, when God introduces himself, he says, I am the Lord who took you out of Egypt. So his identity is wrapped up with the Exodus. So who else came out of Egypt? Jesus. God did. God came out of the Exodus. He didn't just say, I've been sitting on Mount Sinai, waiting for you guys, finally you came out of that nasty country. No, I came out with you. I am the Lord God who brought you out. I took you out. I was there. And because he's always wanting, wanting to come. And so when we pray, there's a bond made between heaven and earth. Isn't that interesting? Because you really believe that God comes and listens. Very personable, very individual, even though the actual prayer we're going to pray is all about community. And there's that beautiful tension that Jewish people wrestle with and thrive in. Okay? But we make a bond between heaven and, and earth. So, there are two versions of our prayer, which we will discuss over the all day tomorrow. There's the one version in Matthew, which is longer, and there's a short version in Luke. And we're going to have to answer the question, why are there two? And so first of all, let's read them. Let's read the, the two different versions. So the first one... Excuse me, Eric. Yes. Um, can we have a break? Can we just stand up? Just stand up? Can yes. Everybody, take a break. <laughs> no problem. Okay, let's take five minutes. Then what we're going to do is we're going to read Matthew, Matthew's version, Luke's version. And, uh, and then what I'm going to do, I'll read them, but I want you to see if you can note the differences. Then, I don't want you to panic that there's differences. Okay. 